All right, well, um, yeah. Hello, beloved family. Um, thank you so much for stopping by. Today, uh, yeah, we're watching a false demon teaching. Now to guard yourselves, guard yourselves. Does that get to you? So I think it's uh, kind of important for me to say that I was a charismatic Christian for quite some time. Uh, I'm incredibly old. And um, so I made a video about this and uh, I was saved in the Brownsville revival. And uh, many skeptics of the charismatic faith propose that this charismatic theology, uh, it's obsessed with the gifts of the spirit, um, spiritual warfare, demons, especially demons actually, and so on. Um, uh, more so than the actual gospel. Uh, and I say this because we so often see these false Christian teachings about demonic warfare, um, Christian spirituality, uh, and they're not at all backed by scripture. Um, so I humbly ask that you pay attention to the words used in this video and, and follow the thoughts proposed to their logical conclusion. Um, you know, test the spirits, and but do so in love. Um, so we may disagree, we may even be really aggravated by people um, <laughs> that are promoting a false gospel, but our refutations must be done with him in the forefront and our ego in the grave. And lastly, please feel free to subscribe. It would really bless me. And please don't forget, um, get out there today and love on someone. Um, please understand that I try to make these videos so that people can avoid uh, the bondage that false Christian teachings impose on its followers. For angels are being released right now. Angels are being dispatched right now. For angels have even been dispatched from Africa right now. We are we are so much freer in Christ when we realize it's all about him. Um, that he is the authority and that your breakthrough it's not reliant on money, money, money. You're going to come up to me and hug my neck and kiss me and say thank you, thank you, thank you for getting that money out of my pocket. <laughs> it, it, he fights our battles for us for he alone is sovereign. So let's do this thing. Now to guard yourselves, guard yourselves, guard yourselves in the Lord, because what we are teaching today will give you some clout in the prayer room. Can I hear an amen? Can I hear an amen? It'll give you some confidence. Let me tell you how my prayer life has changed this last year when I'm not just having these short little conversations with the Lord, but when he, we are partnering, we are partnering together to make some moves on the earth. You so, I mean, I don't mean to be a jerk here, but I uh, I see this a lot uh, in charismatic TikTok videos that um, I discuss with you lovely people. Um, but why, why, why do they feel the need to snap their fingers like that when it comes to prayer? Remember, um, re remember when the apostles did that in the Bible? Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't either. So, I, I mean, it's just an observation, um, but comment down below what you think about that. Does that get to you? now to guard yourselves, guard yourselves, guard yourselves in the Lord, because what we are teaching today will give you some clout in the prayer room. Can I hear an amen? Can I hear an amen? It'll give you some confidence. Let me tell you how my prayer life has changed this last year when I'm not just having these short little conversations with the Lord, but when he, we are partnering, we are partnering together to make some moves on the earth. You know, the garden was originally, we talked about this in session one, and those of you who are new, everything is archived up in our featured in our featured section in the Women of War group. But so it's obvious that this is a, a, like a Women of War group, which is cool um, and all. But I think that you'll start to see very quickly that I mean, it's just riddled with false teachings. And I re I refute this stuff because I lived around it for decades, and um, all it does is it puts the focus on self, it creates bondage and strife, um, because it, it's imposed on you that you have the power through Christ and you have to have enough faith and it's your job to make things happen in the spiritual realm. Ouch! 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 Let the power 
Jesus' name. Come on in this one. Come on in this one. Out this body now. Loose. 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 Out. Now. Jesus' name. And it just so happens that I found the very root of this teaching. Um, so let me show you where it is. There it is. Uh, so it's hot garbage. <laughs> um, it's typically self-aggrandizing and respectfully, it's just riddled with unbiblical teachings. So, but hey, perhaps you still believe in the Pentecostal gifts and hey, I still love you and we can disagree. And even with that assumption, um, let's kind of walk through this video together and following the teachings well, to their logical completion and, and test them against scripture because all scripture is God breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You are going to want to take some notes, whether on paper or on electronic advice. Get your Bible out. Don't yeah. take what we say. Don't take what we say. I encourage you every time we say a scripture verse, go ahead and put it in the comments and go ahead and write it down and then grab your Bible and look through it immediately. Test it. Test the spirit. This is really good. This is what a teaching should involve, encouraging listeners to grab their Bible and test the spirits. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And I'm not gonna preach this whole message during my intro because I know you've got a lot too. And I started this session saying, I don't know what the Lord is gonna do today because I barely have any notes. I've been up since 3 a.m. We've been working on this all week, yeah. really for the last six months, right? And I, I don't know what the Lord is gonna say, but I feel the fire of the Lord now. And I know that you feel the fire in your bones as well because I tell you to wake up and arise because this is what you were made for. Whew, okay, that was quite the intro. <laughs> we are on fire. So, um, yeah, I'm not really sure uh, what this is supposed to mean. Um, this is what you are made for. Um, given I know the recording we are headed through here, <laughs> uh, the context is learning about demonic warfare. Um, and also, now, I'm going to cover authority a little bit later, but you have to understand that authority is never taken. Authority is always given. So as a believer, we don't give authority to the devil. He still has power, but he doesn't have authority over us. Now, if you're not a believer and you've given him authority in your life, then the devil comes and takes it. And we see that in the garden. We see that God gave Adam authority. He gave him dominion. He bestowed that on him. The devil could not come in and take it by force. What did he have to do? He had to lie and trick Adam and Eve into surrendering it. There is often this ridiculous understanding in charismatic theology that uh, to become oppressed or under the attack of Satan and his demonic forces means that we have done something to give Satan authority to do so. Uh, we've somehow opened this door in the spiritual realm and made some kind of um, ridiculous contract with Satan that gives him a free pass to unleash hell on all us. So the erroneous teaching here flows to say that if we have the authority to give Satan permission to attack us, then we have the authority to attack him back or commit spiritual warfare-based tactics um, in order to fight back. And uh, the problem here is because it's presented as some kind of Lord of the Rings war epic um, where we're on the, the battlefields with Satan and stabbing and cutting down demons, um, God is never mentioned uh, or glorified in that picture. It is all about self, just as it was in this lovely lady's comments on authority in this video. The notion that we are oppressed tempted or attacked by Satan because we have given him authority uh, is fallacious. All we have to do to realize this is consider Job. Job 
did not face massive amounts of attack from Satan because Job gave authority to Satan in order to do so. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man, he was blameless and upright and one who feared God and turned away from evil. So we see here, he was blameless and upright, yet Satan was still allowed to do what he did. So I, I mean, I hate to give Satan any kind of, uh, well, anything, um, but Satan is a powerful being, and we see that he can even be in the presence of God in Job 1, chapter 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 tells us, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Satan already has the authority to tempt you and that correlates to the clear depiction of what Satan did in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve. He tempted Eve to sin, just as he tempts us to sin and stay in it for which our flesh it already desires. If Satan needed Eve's authority to tempt her, then how is he able to tempt her in the first place? So this line of thinking is often a preamble to, uh, well, if I have authority to allow Satan in, then I have the authority in Jesus' name to cast him out. And uh, that's how we break Satan's authority. Nowhere in scripture do regular believers cast out devils, are instructed to do so, or have any authority over demons outside of Christ himself or under the direction of the disciples. But even if you believe that the apostolic gifts are relevant for today, James chapter 4 verse 7 teaches us exactly, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is a large subject in and of itself because charismatics will use a multitude of verses to try and establish some kind of authority in this context. Oh, I have the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions from Luke 10, 19. Jesus was talking to the disciples, not the multitude. Not me, not you, fact, sorry. Oh, but, but, I, but I, sit, I sit in heavenly places with Jesus, as is said in, in Ephesians 2, 6. So, so what is his, that's also mine. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Okay, but by this charismatic logic, then you could walk on water and you could save people from sin through your own means. Ephesians is in the context of the richness of God's grace to us that we have a right to the kingdom through Christ, not endowed with the power of Christ. And again, this is all, genuinely, it's all said in love, but do you see how even in this very text, the focus is put on self and my spiritual authority rather than submitting to God? Man, this is gonna be a long one. <laughs> and so Satan has the same thing, he's got ranks, He's got uh, assignments, specific assignments for these demons. They know what they're supposed to do. They know they have a character, they have a name. Mm -hmm. We went into um, some of their characteristics, I believe in 3.1. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't watched that, go back and watch that. We give you Bible verse after Bible verse of characteristics of the demonic, okay? So demons vary in power and ranks. Let's just go ahead and give you some Bible verses because yeah. I know that my people who are like, show me a Bible verse now. Yes, you guys yes. are thirsty. So let's go ahead and get you that. And write them in the comments, mm -hmm. those of you who are to get you to study. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <gasps> On your own. Okay. So Mark 9:29. It's where Jesus says, This kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. This was um, the father brings the boy, he's demonized, he's the, the disciples tried to cast it out, it wouldn't leave, and then Jesus had to step in, deliver the boy, and then in private the disciples were like, why couldn't we do that? And Jesus replied, because it, this type, this kind, this power, this rank, only comes out through prayer and fasting. So this kind, meaning that it varies. Okay, so this is a this is a good point of discussion. 
So let's read Mark chapter 9, verse 29 real quick because the context they're going for at this point in this video is the rank of demons, the hierarchy of the demonic kingdom, etc. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Now, nowhere does it say this power, this rank of demon. With all due respect here, what we just witnessed is the twisting of scripture and what is referred to as eisegesis. Injecting your perceived ideas into the text, into the Bible. And what she is alluding to here, um, as is common with charismatic theology, is to get the demon out, you need to fast for X number of days and pray X amount and that your capabilities are lacking. And that's not at all what Jesus is trying to say here. Uh, we already see earlier in the same book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, that Jesus had already given the disciples the authority to cast out demons. Then he appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out demons. So Jesus didn't say, what. Well, you can only cast out demons up to level eight. No, the truth is, what does prayer do? It increases faith. What does fasting do? It increases faith. It is not the lack of the apostles' authority that comes into question. Jesus already enabled that. It is their lack of faith in Christ the needed work here. But you can see in this lovely lady's explanation the allusion to your own lacking in spiritual prowess. Even though we aren't told to cast out demons, but I digress, that's that's a whole other chat. Um, but the truth of the Bible is to put the emphasis on God and our faith in Him. The total dependence on God is the remedy for many spiritual problems. To be disappointed in yourself is to have trusted in yourself. So you might be saying, well, Daniel, this is a stretch, and she didn't mean that. Okay, maybe, fair enough. Uh, my point being is that the meaning, the wording of scripture has been twisted, and I spotlight that because it's a continuing theme used to try and enforce false doctrine. They're okay um, just letting each other do what they want to do and each having their own assignments. Now, demons also have regions where they govern regions where they have free reign. And they also live in waters. So I want you guys to go ahead and open Mark 4 with me towards the very end. And we see Jesus gets in a boat with his disciples. And they're going to the region of Gerasenes. The region of Gerasenes was the Gentiles. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not even, <laughs> I'm not even going to go into this whole notion of marine spirits and python spirits and all that garbage. But if you'd like me to, if you'd like me to, leave a comment down below. Um, the focus now is the overall teaching, and it's it's just massive inaccuracy. So we continue with Mark four and the event where Jesus calmed the storm over the Sea of Galilee. And so what happens as he enters that region, a storm rises up. A storm rises up and actually, uh, let me see where my notes are here. So the disciples, the disciples think they're dying, Jesus is sleeping, and then he gets up and he rebukes it. He actually forbids it to operate. So there are storms that are demonic in nature. There are weather patterns that are demonic in nature. If they bring death and destruction, you can rest assured that there's demonic activity happening there. And if the church would realize their authority to pray against and bind and rebuke those things, 
um, I think we would see a lot less Absolutely. of stuff that we're, that's happening right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. If there is death and destruction, you can be sure that there is demonic activity there. So all storms are demonic then? I mean, you could easily make the case that every storm causes death and destruction. Every storm kills a person and a plant and an insect and a fish, causes destruction by breaking tree limbs or scratching my truck. I mean, when does it stop? This is a game in ambiguity. Even if Satan, as Prince of the Air, did control weather patterns, it is only under the sovereign authority of God. But the big issue is this false teacher begins to say that the church has the authority to bind and rebuke weather patterns. So if that's the case, then all of these highly intelligent and well-studied men and women of God are murderers for allowing hurricanes. And next, nowhere in the Bible are we regular believers taught to bind demons, let alone bind weather. I've touched on this in other videos, but binding, which is in multiple parts of the Bible, like Matthew 18, 18, but all point to the same thing. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is about church discipline, the disciples being authorized to define and enforce the parameters of the new covenant church. Binding and loosing is a term from antiquity that meant to define something as allowable or not. Nowhere in scripture are we taught to rebuke a demon, or again, let alone the weather. Even the powerful archangel Michael he refused to rebuke Satan himself. He said, the Lord rebuke you in Jude chapter one, verse nine. So we have ambiguity about storms being demonic, which I suppose could be possible, uh, but then it's followed up with hard false teaching. So I say in love that this is not an individual who studies scripture. This is sadly an individual who seeks to embolden what she already believes, and it's false. We have to be very careful about who we listen to and be sure to see if the Word of God lines up. We have no power over the weather in a spiritual sense. We aren't all mini Elijahs and Jesuses. Otherwise, I'd love to see someone that believes this actually walk on water or verifiably raise someone from the dead. There is so much confusion about how to pray for weather patterns. I remember the very first time about six years ago, a friend of mine who we didn't really do all this, you know, but she said, you know what? This is a church event. I'm going to pray against the storm. And sure enough, it pushed off about four hours. And I honestly thought that that was heretical at the time because everything that happens is within the will of God, right? especially as it comes to weather. And that started my journey, honestly, here, when we started talking about the sovereignty of God and what that actually looks like. God is asking you to partner with him because these storms do not always have to happen. Yeah, yeah. So lovingly, I ask you, <laughs> keep your wits about you. When, when someone is using experience over the word of God, I mean, from what I'm seeing, this friend came against the storm and it was a four hour delay and not a single scripture was used. How do we know that the storm just held off? We take authority over Dorian that has no right off the coast of this state. Especially given that once again, nowhere in scripture are believers told to rebuke or bind the weather. Christians who are, are they're truly seeking God try to be like the Bereans and ensure that anything is of God and that it lines up with his word. Non-believers, non-believers have a field day when Christians are out yelling at the wind or rain as self-glorified apostles and, and they're bringing glory only to self and not to God. I honestly thought that that was heretical at the time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was. It actually looks like God is asking you to partner with him because these storms do not always have to happen. Yeah, yeah. So we already know we can't rebuke, bind, or come against the weather, um, but we can ask God with thanksgiving. And I'm curious as to where in the Bible God 
asked us, us filthy rags, to partner with him in order to stop these storms. Yeah. So then we move into Mark 5. Jesus and the disciples have now landed at the shore. Who meets them there? The demoniac is right there waiting for them. It says that as Jesus stepped off the boat, his feet hit the ground, the man was already there. He was immediately met by the demoniac. How did that man know who was in that boat? There is no transfer of information here, okay? Jesus does not have an Instagram. He's not like, hey, <laughs> head into the Gary scenes, feeling cute, my cast out a demon. No, it's not happening. There's no um, transfer of information. Nothing's going out, okay? So what is going out? In the spirit realm, there's information going in the spirit realm, which is another confirmation that that storm was actually demonically influenced. Mm -hmm. I do love these ladies. It does seem like they love Jesus. But as many charismatics teach, um, this is a realm of ambiguity. Of course there is a spiritual domain and therefore information within it. But just exactly how does the demonic immediately going to Jesus on the shore signify and confirm that the storm was demonic or not? The scripture doesn't say that and respectfully, she didn't use one scripture to test the spirit and confirm her own statement. Mm -hmm. So the Bible actually says that that man saw him from afar, meaning by the time afar, I don't know how far that is, but by the time he walked or ran to the shore, Jesus got off the boat, meaning he probably saw him from the water. Now, was it him in the natural who saw him? No. It was the demons inside of him who recognized him because he immediately fell to his knees and said, Jesus, why are you tormenting me? <laughs> so was it the information that was passed back and forth and created the storm? Or did the demons just see him? Which one? Following this to its logical end, it doesn't result in a clear exegetical direction. It's more confusion upon more ambiguity and self-empowering suggestion. So, <laughs> what does the scripture say? Mark chapter 5 verse 6. So when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. When he saw Jesus from afar, when he saw him then he ran. <laughs> there wasn't some demonic storm that cryptically informed the demons on the shore that Jesus was on his way, uh, because scripture it just doesn't say that. By your own logic, that would say that the storm was not demonically influenced. You know, he saw him <laughs> from a, a distance. Picture. So how did he know who was in that boat? And it's the spirits. The spirits communicate. There's a line of communication between the demonic. They're transferring information. And um, so how did he know who was in that boat? We just established it by scripture. He saw Jesus from afar. Nothing in scripture says the demonic cloud entities flagged down legion and let him know that Jesus was on the way. But again, it would make certain sense that obviously demons communicate, uh, but there is nothing in this instance, in this miracle, that the storm was demonic, uh, that the storm caused a, a communication pipeline uh, to be fired off to legion. Um, this is false teaching, and we can only go by what scripture actually says. And he saw Jesus from afar. Beloved family, I ask that you pray for these lovely sisters. There is more to the video, um, but this one is already quite long with a lot of content, and I wanted to, to dive a bit deeper into each element, but there was so much, so let me know if I need to expand on anything. Please keep your wits sharpened. <laughs> I hope you understand that it is my heart to point out twisted scripture, false teachings, subtle allusions to self-grandeur, and false self-empowerment, because I don't want you to fall into bondage. We are called to salvation by His grace and to seek Christ in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. We aren't called to stress out about 
uh, reaching this 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 certain level of righteousness in order to be some kind of spiritual warlord. Uh, we aren't called to go around reclaiming territories and talking to demons. So I hope I speak in love and that we were able to learn something together today. I really do appreciate you and your input and thank you so much for sticking around. Um, so get out there, love on someone, and God bless you, and I'll see you on the next one.